Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. And we're taping today before a live audience at American University's Washington College of Law as part of a symposium on empowering employees to protect food integrity sponsored by the Government Accountability Project. And we spent the day talking mostly about how to protect the public against micro, uh, microbiological contaminants. Very serious problems. We've heard uh, harrowing st stories about deaths uh, and, 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 and injury. Um, but ironically, perhaps, uh, an equally perhaps dangerous uh, menace to public health is that of highly processed, highly palatable foods. And we're honored today to be joined by Dr. David Kessler, former uh, commissioner of FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, between 1990 and 1997, uh, first under President Bush the first, and then under President Bill Clinton. Uh, the New York Times praised his tenure there, saying that he revitalized a beleaguered agency. Dr. Kessler is the former dean of the medical schools at Yale and the University of California at San Francisco, where he still serves as professor of pediatrics, epidemiology, and biostatistics. He holds a law degree from the University of Chicago and a medical degree from Harvard. I already hate you. <laughs> and he's the author of books on the tobacco industry and most recently, the bestseller, The End of Overeating, Taking Control of the Insatiable American Appetite. He's got too many awards and honors to mention, so I won't bother. Welcome, Dr. Kessler, to the symposium and to Whistle Where You Work. Thanks for having me. In 2007, you testified before Congress, and you said at that time something that we heard a lot today at the symposium, that the American food system is broken. Do you still think that's true? I think that's very, um, very much true. I think there are a lot of people working very hard on trying to fix it. Um, my good colleague, uh, Mike Taylor, who is Deputy Commissioner uh, for Policy uh, at uh, FDA, uh, we had the privilege of working together, and then Mike went over to run FSIS under the Clinton administration. He's come back. Food Safety and Inspection Service. Right. Yeah. He's come back and working for uh, both uh, Peggy Hamburg and, and Josh Sharfstein. Um, Mike described it to me, um, I, I think he won't mind my, my saying, you know, uh, Commissioner Hamburg uh, brought him in uh, to really help on food. He says it's like driving um, a race car around the track you know, while you're trying to redesign the car at the same time. So I think there are a lot of people working to try to fix the problem um, and working hard, but no one should have any illusions. The food safety system, and I think Mike would be the first one to say it, um, is, I mean, there really isn't a system in place. What is the American food safety system, the governmental but, food safety Again, I, when you really understand it, you first, there is no system in place. The, the way it works is, for, there has to be a problem. The horse has to be out of the barn. And then you go chase the, the horse once it's out of the barn. And that just is no way to have an integrated food safety system. The system that was designed back you know, at the turn of the previous century. So we, we still are operating under the basic tools of the 1938 Act. And they are a system of reactive tools. Right? So you're chasing the problem. So where I think a lot of work, and we started it by regulation. So we started it in seafood. Uh, USDA you know, put it in place on meat. And I think everybody's aware of the HACCP kind of methodology, which is really the fundamental shift, to move from a reactive system to put into place a proactive system. Or understand the difference. Under a reactive system, somebody gets sick, and then you trace back, try to figure out you know, what made them sick. And we, you know, we are much better today, CDC, PulseNet, the number of food outbreaks that we can identify, 
I mean, one of the reasons why we may be seeing more is that identification of people getting sick, right? Because we, there's this federal de database we're working with the states and fingerprinting of this organism. So we know there's an outbreak. So that's where the progress has been made of knowing that there are foodborne illnesses out there, but then tracking it back to the food, you know, which food it is, right? I mean, and then trying to figure out what you do about it, that's still the, been in place for the last 100 years. So that's a reactive system. So what we, and I think it's fair to say that system is not even a system at all. So what we need to do is to this system of preventive controls, which says, look, we're not gonna wait for a problem to happen. We're going to put in a set of requirements. What are the critical control points? Where can microbiological uh, hazards, where can other kinds of hazards happen within the, um, to food along the way? And you're gonna monitor the food production and distribution so that you catch the problem before the um, food is ever released for public consumption. That is a fundamental change. I mean, in, but it is the change in both the Durbin and the Waxman Dingle Deloro bill um, that's presently uh, under uh, consideration. A major, major change. So, so you have a, you have that. That's the first major change. The second is if you look at the tools that FDA has available. The tools are again the 1938 Act was one of the first the, 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 one of the nation's first consumer protection laws. So just think about it. I mean, there's been multiple consumer protection laws enacted, EPA, Consumer Product Safety, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. FDA is the oldest, and so the tools are still the most primitive. So when I was commissioner, I couldn't even embargo I mean, contaminated food. I would have to get the state to do it. You can't require, you know, um, FDA can go in and look around the plant. It can take samples today. So it walks into a plant, it looks around the plant, it can take samples, it could turn, you know, look under here, look under there. But if you're the, you're the food manufacturer, I can say, can you show me your testing records? Can you show me where um, that food was shipped? There is no obligation under those laws that were written 100 years ago for any kinds of record inspections or any law enforcement tools. So those are the two major changes that have to happen. And I think with the number of outbreaks that have happened over the last number of years, I think a consensus has emerged um, that we clearly have to change the system dramatically because the system is broken. So if we are more proactive and we do have these new legal tools, are the resources sufficient currently at FDA to do the job for the American people? Well, just by the way you asked that question, you, you know the answer, right? <laughs> So the, the good news, I mean, understand FDA has about 10,000 employees plus. Um, it regulates about 90% uh, of the food supply. If you look at the number of FDA inspectors today dedicated to food, number, you know, let's say it's 500, and, and that's for 90% of the food supply. USDA has about 10 times that number and one-tenth of the regulatory jurisdiction. So there is this historical imbalance, in part because of different regulatory systems, but also in different appropriations. So the answer is unequivocally not. Now, as part of the, the legislation, there is for the first time user fees, right? you, you know, registration fees of food establishment. But if you do the math, right, you quickly understand, I mean, just, under, I mean, just for a second comprehend Right, how vast this is. Understand I mean, where your food is coming from. I think the, the New York Times uh, front page story I mean, about a month ago, if you haven't read it, you all need to read it. The hamburger story, right? The, the, the story that basically, when you read it, I mean, even for, I mean, and I'm not a food purist, you can't eat a hamburger. I mean, five different sources of where the, hum the hamburger's coming from. If you understand, it's, our food's coming from all around the, the, the globe, right? So you, you, our fruits are coming from Chile, our shrimp is coming from Thailand, our fish are coming from China. 
I mean, the, the, the enormity of the task, I mean, to feed a hungry nation. You're never going to have the resources that you need to be able to really do the jobs. I mean, the FDA is in a plan today maybe once every 10 years. I mean, they, that just is unacceptable. And especially if you're going to put this HACCP system in place, how are you going to go in and really make sure that, I mean, going into a plant and looking even once a year, I mean, is, is really a drop in the bucket. So, I mean, I, I think the real goal is to think about how you can leverage regulatory, what's the right framework? And, and one of the things that's, that's very interesting to me, FDA never grew up, that, the FDA regulatory culture was a scientific law enforcement culture. And that's the, the, the tools that it, it basically uh, grew up with over the last hundred years. It never incorporated, it really never even thought about right, where the whistleblower fits in. And when you think about how to leverage FDA's resources. So HACCP is, in essence, you know, it the, puts the responsibility on the manufacturer, right, to, to put in the system of preventive controls, and then FDA oversees that. But if you don't have the resources, how are you going to be able to leverage that? And that's why whistleblower protection um, and strong whistleblower protection, so I mean, in a modern consumer protection statute, is almost a must if it's going to be effective. Okay, and we're going to come back and talk about that at length. I want to talk to you a little bit first about your new book, uh, The End of Overeating, because you say something very interesting. Well, in well, if you look at the cover, what grabs your attention? So what do you look at? Oh, well, first, carrot cake. Carrot cake. So the question is, if you understand the, the, the cover of that jacket is designed by Chip Kidd, if you understand the cover, it took me a while uh, after he did it, um, you understand the neurobiology. I mean, how many, what percentage of you are, are get directed toward, look, when you look at that, look at the carrots, right? So there's always about one, there's one of you, right? <laughs> the, the rest of us look at the cheese So you understand the neurobiology of eating, where our attention is focused. You say that uh, since 1980, we've had an outbreak of obesity. Before that time, that there was a kind of homeostasis in the population, that over the course of history, that adult weights at various ages were basically stable. And then all of a sudden, we have this huge spike. So for instance, in 1960, since 1960 to the year 2000, across the board, adult women have increased in weight 25 to 30 pounds. my colleague, Catherine Flagel, one of the great epidemiologists at CDC, to graph for me what it looked like of weight over an adult lifetime. And what she showed me, if you go back to the NHANES data in the 1960s, you entered your adult, uh, you know, your 20s, maybe you gained a few pounds till you were 40, basically flat from 40 to 60, and then maybe you lost a few pounds from 60 and beyond. That was the curve back in the 1960s. If you look at the curve today, you enter your 20s, the average male enters their 20s 18 pounds heavier. And you continue to gain weight much later. So something's happened in the last three decades, it's not genetics, to result in this very significant uh, epidemic. And what you attribute that to is what you describe as highly palatable food, that is foods rich in salt, sugar, and fats. So fat and sugar, fat and salt, fat, sugar, and salt, and I didn't realize this, I mean, stimulate us to eat more and more. 
Um, I thought I was eating for nourishment. I thought I was eating for nutrition, for satisfaction, to fill myself up. I mean, I asked my, my colleague, G Gitano Di Cherry. He's one of the great pharmacologists. Gitano published the most significant paper on dopamine and drugs of abuse, on amphetamine, cocaine, morphine, and heroin. And it was always thought that drugs of abuse would elevate brain dopamine. Brain dopamine does what? I mean, it focuses your attention. Opioids do pleasure, but you know, it's locked in attention to a stimuli where you can't get it out of your, your head, right? So you have brain dopamine, and so if amphetamine and cocaine was always thought to raise brain dopamine. Food gave you maybe a little bump, but the second and third time it habituated. Right? You, did, you didn't get this rise in, um, in, in brain dopamine. So I said to Gitano, can we take you know, food and make it, you know, add fat and sugar together, make it multisensory, and give it over a long period of time? And Gitano said, well, you, if food, you, you won't get the elevation in brain dopamine, and we did the experiments, and there it was. I mean, so fat and sugar, uh, fat and salt, fat, sugar, and salt, really, with the multisensory nature, you give it over a repeat period of time, they literally, literally hijacks the, the brain circuitry. Let me just give you another piece of, of, of data. We asked the question, let me give you three characteristics. A hard time resisting your favorite foods, to a lack of um, feeling of being able to stop, a hard time stopping eating. Right? Three, a preoccupation of thinking about foods between meals, or sometimes you're eating something and you're thinking about what you're gonna eat next, right? Or that pizza box is there and you're thinking about there's one slice left, am I gonna get that last slice or not? Or that piece of carrot cake. Right. So those three characteristics, loss of control, lack of satiation, a preoccupation, a thinking about foods between meals, those three characteristics, we went out and what we found is that 50% of people who are obese, 30% of people who are overweight, 20% of people who are healthy weight score very high on those three characteristics. Those three characteristics are ele elements of a conditioned and driven behavior, not a disease, right? And then we scan the brains of people who had um, those three characteristics, this conditioned hypereating, and we scanned it in two phases, just, just the anticipation of food, not even giving them the food, you're just cueing them, just the smell, showed elevated activation of the brain amygdala region. Right? And then when they started eating the food, the amygdala, the reward centers of the brain stayed activated until all the food was gone. So there's a biological reason why for millions of Americans, it's so hard to stop. And what's at the core of that? Fat, sugar, and salt. And so effectively what you're saying is that the foods we're taking in that we're eating are rewiring our brains organically. It isn't simply a, a state of, well, I like something better or it, something biological is happening. Does the food industry know that that's what they're doing? So what's been the business plan of the modern American food company? I mean, if you look over the last 20 years, what's happened? It's been to take fat, sugar, and salt, put it on every corner, make it available 24-7. I mean, it's, it's in gas stations today. You can't walk down the street. I mean, I was on, just in Northern Virginia, driving down Royal Highway. It's Papa John's, Domino's, Applebee's, Chili's, Krispy Kreme. I mean, just, just look at the food, I mean, the, the availability. We're constantly being bombarded with food cues. You know, at least we grew up in an environment, you know, where there was structure. I mean, our kids are growing up I mean, in, an, in an environment where their brains are constantly being subjected to this. Look, let me explain to you how it works. And I did this to a major food company. I was invited to, to talk to a small company. And, and we have to be careful because there's, there's tobacco. I mean, there's some analogies and there's some differences. Nicotine. Nicotine is a moderately reinforcing chemical. Add to that nicotine the smoke, the throat scratch the cellophane crinkling of the pack, the color of the pack, the image of the cowboy, right? The emotional gloss 30, 40 years ago of people who, uh, it was sexy to smoke. What did we do? We took a reinforcing chemical and we added all those other stimuli onto that nicotine and we ended up with a significantly addictive product. I give you a package of sugar and I say, go have a good time. And you'll say, what are you talking about? Now add to that sugar fat, add temperature, add texture, add mouthfeel, 
add color, put it on every corner, make it socially acceptable to eat, add the emotional gloss of advertising, walk into you know, a food court, go into Union Station, go down to the food court, watch people eat. We're living in a food carnival. What do we expect? So what's going on? I mean, I mean, for millions of people, I mean, their brains are literally being hijacked by all the food cues in the environment. And it's not just us. I mean, it's our kids. In 1994, while you were commissioner, um, 30 years after the Surgeon General's report linking tobacco smoking, cigarette smoking to cancer, and all sorts of other problems, uh, it still was the case there was a consensus that you couldn't take on the tobacco industry. You couldn't do anything about it. Uh, you commissioned a study within the FDA to look at the possibility that nicotine was an addictive product. Uh, and you determined that, in fact, it was an addictive product and took regulatory action against it. But it was critical to you at that time to have inside information about how the, in that the industry knew what they were doing because the law requires that for you to regulate it as a drug the industry, they need to know that that's what they're attempting to do to your brain. How did you get that information? So we had two um, wonderful, actually there were a whole group of FDA professionals. Um, I remember, you know, we went around the table in the very beginning. Um, a colleague of mine came up to me one day and said, Commissioner, I think you should take on tobacco. Um, and I looked at him. Imagine the reaction I gave him. So my first reaction was, what do you think? It was, it was you're crazy. And I remember convening a, he kept on bugging me. And I remember convening a, I said, all right, just to get him off my back, we can do a briefing. And I went around the room, and I said, all right, what do you think? Uh, Nesbitt here says we should regulate tobacco. So we went around the room. Fool's errand, political suicide. It'll consume all your resources. Yes, it's the right thing to do, right? But you're not going to be able to do drugs for HIV or food labeling or blood you know, safety. They're going to come after you. General counsel, I remember, you know how general counsels talk, on the one hand this, on the other hand that, right? And then there was a young woman next, sitting next to her, her boss, the general counsel, who looked at me and said, if you're willing to take on tobacco, I'm willing to spend the rest of my career working on it. And I still remember that. Because it took 15 years from that meeting to fast forward you know, to the Rose Garden this year, this June, where President Obama signed the bill. That persistence, staying with an issue when the cameras are on and when the cameras are off, are probably absolutely key. But we, you know, the, the, the question of what did the industry know? Because I mean, what was key here? What did we really do? What was the, the success? Because it's important for food. What, what was the, the real success about tobacco? Was, it wasn't about laws and regulations. We changed how this country viewed the product. And part of how we viewed that, right, very honestly, was to stigmatize the industry. And what did the industry know? Right? And I, we had Mitch Zeller, one of the great uh, congressional investigators had, had come over. We had Gary and Tom. Gary, Gary worked for FDA, was Army CID, best you know, polygrapher. Tom Doyle, who was former CIA, Secret Service, um, working at um, FDA. And we literally went to find you know, uh, whistleblowers. I mean, I remember one day, they're bringing somebody into my office, um, and I only knew him by his code name, Research. Um, and I'm going through a telephone directory, because Gary and Tom says, well, I'll only talk to you, Commissioner. Right? And they weren't thrilled with that, because the one rule when you have an informant is, you, you know, if you're, you're a law enforcement, you control the informant. They don't control you. But he said, I'll only talk to you if you'll talk to the Commissioner. So I said, all right, I'll do it. And I'm going through a telephone directory, see who else. Comp I had a company telephone directory of who, where he worked. And I'm saying, you know, do you know this person? Do you think this person will talk to us? What about this person? And then I remember I looked at him and I said, who's this guy, Jeff Weigand? Will he talk to us? And research looked at me and he smiled and he said, I'm Jeff Weigand. Um, you know, he had his briefcase and it had a monogram 
on it, J.W. Wygand was the protagonist in the movie The Insider. But Wygand you know, really was the highest ranking whistleblower that really led on that the companies knew all along that tobacco was addictive, but more importantly, that they manipulated the level of nicotine. And that helped change how this country views the, the product. He was one of, of many. Uh, uh, Could you have made the case without him? No. Th there was no, understand that the statutory question, right? The, 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 the definition of a drug is an article intended to affect the structure or function of the body. And intent was defined by the courts as the manufacturer's intent. So we had to go, you know, if you ask the companies, what did you intend? They said, it's a natural product, nicotine. Right? Do you intend to affect the structure of the function of the body? No, of course not. It's just there for pleasure. So where did we have to go? We had to go inside the, the industry. So we were aimed at the heart of the industry before we even, they knew we were aimed at the heart of the industry before we even knew we were aimed at the heart of the industry. But we had to go inside the companies. And there was no way. You talk about primitive tools. We didn't have subpoena power. You don't have subpoena power when you do food. So, so, I mean, just think about the enormity of food. Think about HACCP. Think about the system of preventive controls. Think about you can never have the number of inspectors. How can you ever assure the safety of the food supply? Right? Not, you, you can't be there. I mean, FSIS has a model where the inspectors are there every day. FDA is there at once every 10 years. But you have to be able to leverage that system. You have to have people who are there who are willing to talk to you. All right, well, let's bring this back around again. Uh, you were able to establish that there was an intent on the part of the tobacco industry to addict people through nicotine. Let's go back to the highly palatable foods, where we've already established that the food industry knows that they're uh, layering on the sugar, the salt, the fat, that like the cigarette, the tobacco industry, they're targeting kids, the effect of Joe Camel on the Frosted Flake commercials for kids, same sorts of things. Uh, and um, and we're in a situation where uh, the food industry uh, largely goes unregulated uh, for purposes of salt, sugar, and fat content. If at a certain portion, proportion of product or dosage of salt, sugar, and fat, we know that the impact is going to be to induce obesity, should that be a regulated product? So so certainly food is a regulated product. I mean, and I think you know, obesity is a foodborne illness. But my concern goes even deeper than sugar, fat, and salt. I mean, understand much of what we're eating today is probably not even food. I mean, it's been so highly processed that in essence we're, I mean, ju just just go and um, see how long it takes you to, I mean, 20 years ago, it took us the average bite about 20, 30 times. Today, food is so highly processed, anything objectionable is out of that food, taken out of that food, right? We're, in essence, eating adult baby food constantly. And so you, you have to wonder, it's so highly processed, right? I mean, there's, I mean, it is, there's very little real food in much of, what we're eating. I mean, I mean understand how well, that happened. Let me, let me ask you this. I mean, we're going to come back to that. But uh, you're adding another dimension to perhaps the point I'm, I'm trying to elicit, which is that this isn't really even food, in a sense. Uh, should it be treated for purposes of regulatory authority as a drug when we know that its impact is directed at certain centers of the brain in order to induce certain behavior that causes a, a, a major public health risk. Yeah. So, so, the, so um, drugs you want to test for both safety and efficacy. You want to make sure the drug does what it says it does on the label. Food, you're concerned primarily with safety. My concern is that um, I think there is a great deal of issues on microbiological contaminants, but I think there also is very significant problems on the adulteration side. Right? And I think much of what, I mean, I have concerns that we really don't have a full handle on um, what's really um, being added to our food in many instances and what is real. 
I mean, there is a, there's a basic premise that you have to, that you learn when you're a regulator, right? If you could sell something, right? I mean, if, if there's an economic markup right, of any significant proportion, and you can make it look like that product. I mean, I, I didn't get it until I, one day was, we were involved and we, were here, we heard about this counterfeit baby formula right, uh, operation out on the West Coast. I mean, think about it, counterfeit baby formula? Who would ever think about making counterfeit baby formula? Right? And, but, but if you can make it look the same, right, and you can, so the, the, there's that in, economic incentive. I mean, my guess is significant. If you look at juice, if you look at the number of products, I mean, if you really went and you analyzed what's in this food, the economic incentive is great enough so you could be sure there's significant adulteration going on out there. Without, I mean, without even improving it, I can tell you that, it, that it's happening based on that economic model. And that concerns me greatly. It's not just sugar and fat and salt, it's also, um, what's being added uh, to our food and what is real uh, compared to what's on the label. Well, let's talk about perhaps how to attack this at its source. Author uh, Michael Pollan wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in September in which he argued that perhaps the most important part of federal health care reform legislation isn't the public option for insurance, that it's ensuring that um, once uh, that uh, pre-existing conditions are covered, because once pre-existing conditions are covered and the health insurance companies can't just deny coverage to people or dump people that they don't want, they're gonna have a real vested interest in taking on the obesity crisis because it's gonna bankrupt them otherwise. Uh, and taking on the food industry. I think there are very, I mean, I, I think Michael Pollan I'm a great fan. I think he, his, the whole movement of he and Alice Waters to moving toward real food is key. I think there are strong arguments for the public option. Um, I want one to, um, and, and I think it is, it is important. I always find it interesting that um, those, um, you know, on the industry side, on the corporate side, always says, you know, look, the government isn't efficient. Uh, we, we're in, in the private sector is much more efficient, but now we say if there's a public option, um, uh, you know they're going to put us out of business. So if how does, but if the government's inefficient and they're more efficient, why will they be put out of business? So so I don't understand the. Uh, the I think there's an, uh, a strong argument for a public option, but there is no question. Um, but we we got to be very careful on where this is heading over the next couple of decades. Because you're going to see discriminatory practices, and I, this concerns me greatly. Um, I, I took a, I, I got a call by a reporter from the Atlantic uh, on the New Jersey race, um, and he quoted me. The governor's race. Governor's race, because uh, uh, Corzine was running these ads against Christie that clearly was focused on Christie's weight. And, again, and even though it went against my political sort of leanings, I found you know, Corzine's ads just totally offensive. Right? I mean, because he was basically uh, saying, how could you trust Corzine to be governor because he's fat? I mean, and I just, I mean, to me, that was unacceptable and, and crossed the line. So, um, I mean, you may dis disagree with his politics, right? But this notion of um, you're gonna find a lot of pressure in discriminatory practices over the next 20 years. The problem is not obesity. People want to be thin, but they want the food. The problem is the food. And we, and we have to keep our eye on that. Right? Especially if we now know that people's brains are, are literally being hijacked. And, it's, it, and, it, and I, I have suits in every size, so I can, I can tell you. And even people who are thin have problems, a significant percentage, at 20%, uh, their brains are activated. <coughs> We've got to be very careful in this that we don't create incentives um, so that they, those incentives turn into discrimination against people who are obese um, and try to have insurance incentives um, so that they can't get coverage unless they lose weight or there's penalties 
um, because it, it's much harder. We have to be more empathetic. But wouldn't it be an incentive for preventative care and for addressing the issues that lead to obesity? If, if you, if you want to, if you focus on obesity and you don't focus on the food, right, by the very nature, you're never going to get a handle on that problem. If you want to be thin, if you want to lose weight, but you still want to glorify the food or you want the food, it's never, we're just focused on the wrong thing. All right, well, let's talk about restaurants because you note in your book that 50% of the American food dollar today is spent in restaurants, and restaurants specialize in highly palatable foods. Uh, one measure that is being taken, it's being taken right now in Montgomery County, right outside of Washington, D.C., is to require that restaurants uh, label the caloric values of the food that they're selling and provide information to the consumer about uh, how fat, how rich the food is, uh, so they can make a decision about it. Does that make a difference? In New York City, they've had that law for a year. There was an op-ed recently in the New York Times to the effect that uh, it hasn't made any difference at well, all in consumer behavior. I, I can tell you it certainly has made a uh, change in my behavior. I mean, so I go into a bun pan and I look at that muffin and that muffin is 800 calories or that salad is 1300 calories. You ever wonder how you can make a salad that energy dense, right? When, when, a, when a hamburger has 400 calories and a salad has 1400 calories, I mean, it is, I mean, I, I think it does change the behavior, but, I, but, but understand why those laws are so important. It's not just the effect on the consumer. It's also the effect on the industry. So, so the, you, if you walk into Chile, I walked into Chile's, and they used to have the Awesome Blossom. I remember the Awesome Blossom. And all of a sudden, it wasn't on the menu. And so I said to the, the person behind the counter, why not? He said, well, the California menu law had went, gone into effect. And I said, what? He says, yeah, well, the Awesome Blossom, according to him, I, I don't know this, I mean, it was, had some 3,000 calories. Right? And when, when they had us with the California menu, the company didn't want to label it as 3,000 calories, so it took it off the menu and came up with something else. So understand I mean, whether that's true, I mean, what actually happened uh, in that story, the fact is th there are incentives that labeling creates incentives for manufacturers to redesign their products, right? So that they're not as outrageous. I, it, I mean, I had to go the Washington Post out of me, because, you know, to do the book, um, I went dumpster diving because we worked on that nutrition facts panel on all processed foods, right, back in the 90s. But there was nothing the equivalent in restaurants. So I literally had to go dumpster diving for a year to find out what is being added to the food. And our food is being layered and loaded with sugar, fat, and salt. I mean, and again, I think there is, you look at the concerns beyond microbiological. I mean, I mean added fat, added sugar should be on the label. Should be on the nutrition facts panel because it'll create the incentive. There has to be, I mean, calorie labeling right there on the menu, right? I mean, uh, next to uh, the, the the product. I mean, but there's sneaky ways around this, which you note in the book for the labeling that's on food that's sold in stores, for instance. Rather than having one form of sugar in a product. Now manufacturers will put in three or four so that each of the sugar items falls at the bottom of the list of additives in the product. Right. So, so you know, the, what are we going to need to be able to kind of regulatory system? How do we make sure that what's on the label is true? Right. How do we make sure there's full disclosure? How do we make sure there aren't adulterants that are added um, to food? Even if they don't cause disease, do, uh, is there economic adulteration? So it's not just microbiological hazards. It's not just sugar, fat, or salt. I mean, I mean, there is an enormous amount of work to be done in the food area. And this and takes us back to the, the beginning, what you were talking about in terms of the inability based on of the resources that exist for FDA or USDA or whomever is regulating in the food context, especially at the retail level. Let's say there is food labeling. Who is going to blow the whistle on? Right. So, 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 so th that, that is fundamental. I mean, and you, what you basically have today is a system where everybody's going like this. Right? Because if, if your food is being shipped in from overseas and you have the distributor and wholesaler and who's responsible along that chain? I mean, and the answer is everybody has to be responsible. I mean, including the purveyor I mean, of the product. And if you recognize that we need to prevent 
problems from happening. And you can only prevent problems from happening is if you put systems in place in the plan. And we really should also talk about putting, play, you know, I, I, the thing we have not talked about, and it's not talked about enough, but it's something that's going to have to be thought about. If you really want to eliminate 0157 and other uh, microbiological hazards, you can't just do it in the plant. You're going to have to go onto the farm. And that is, we have to recognize, is politically treacherous for any administration. But that's sort of the, the, the thing that has not been fully brought out. But if, but if we're going to make those, but, but, but just saying, you're going to have to be inside the industry. Right? If you're going to put a system of preventive controls, you're going to be inside the industry on microbiological contaminants, on what's on the label, and on uh, adulterants. And there is no way, no way, right, that FDA is ever going to have the resources, um, no matter, even if you give them all the resources in the world, to be able to uncover that. So as we think about, right, as, as we think about regulatory frameworks, I mean, and here's the great opportunity, right? Because we, have, I mean, I mean, they're up, um, uh, and it's pro and it shouldn't just be, you know, the, uh, specialized just in the food area. I mean, we have to get to the point where it's across, you know, important products. Right? You have it what? You have it um, in ground, in transportation. You have it in nuclear regulatory. You you have it in a number of areas, certainly in the food area. Um, thinking of putting in whistleblower protection is key. And FDA has never really thought about it. it it's not been, I mean, it's recently, I mean, certainly in the medical device center, it's becoming more prominent. But, you know, I will admit in the seven years I was commissioner, I don't think, you know, there was a one whistleblower, except in the tobacco case, where, where it was key. It wasn't part of the regulatory system. And so if and, HR, and it needs to be. And if HR um, 2749S510 become law, how do you anticipate that will alter uh, that, that context for uh, workers in the food industry coming forward? So I think, I mean, it's, it's an important step, right? It is a very important step I mean, to have whistleblower protection, right? And then you want whistleblower, I mean, and as you and as GAP know, I mean, you know, better than anyone else, there's all different levels of protection, right? So there's protection of uh, a whistleblower, and I mean, are there criminal penalties for retaliation? And then you get into the complex question of what are the incentives, right, for somebody to come. But, but that's for another, let's just start with getting whistleblower protection I mean, into the food safety and food adulteration areas, getting FDA comfortable with that, right? getting FDA new sets of tools, that will be major, major progress, I mean, in fixing this system. Well, many thanks to Dr. David Kessler for joining us for this symposium and for this taping of Whistle Where You Work. Uh, I want to thank the Washington College of Law for hosting us for this event. Uh, I'm Mark Cohen. Thank you.